Hello and welcome to Dialogue. For 65 years, China and Sri Lanka have enjoyed friendly diplomatic ties, but their mutually beneficial relationship goes back even further to the historic Ceylon China Treaty Agreement of 1952, otherwise known as Rubber Rice Pact, when both countries helped each other in the time of great need. Today, how are the two countries dealing with each other and what challenges still lie ahead in their relationship? To help us answer these questions, I'm honored today to talk with uh, Ambassador of Sri Lanka to China, Dr. Palita Kahona. That's our topic. I'm Xu Qinduo. Welcome to the show, Ambassador. As we know, this year marks the 65th anniversary of the diplomatic ties between the two countries. So look back over the past 60 years and half a decade, what's your assessment of the overall relationship? I think we have to uh, look at our relationship in the light of our long-standing connections. Uh, our relationship goes back over 2,000 years. And that is the foundation on which our current relationship has been developed. Uh, Sri Lanka was one of the first countries to recognize the Young People's Republic. And as you quite rightly mentioned earlier in your introduction, in 1952, 70 years ago, Sri Lanka reached an interesting embargo on the export of strategic material to China and agreed to send rubber to China in exchange for rice. Uh, that is how important we thought that the relationship was at the time. Later on, we established uh, diplomatic relations in 1957. And you have to remember that as little as we, we are, we were one of the noisiest advocates of China's assumption of its legitimacy at the United Nations. Later on, China reciprocated magnificently when it contributed to Sri Lanka's development. Uh, even today, we have uh, the magnificent uh, uh, Bandaranaika Memorial Conference Center in Colombo, which was built by Chinese assistants, with Chinese assistants. More recently, during the conflict with the Terrorist LTTE, China, Sri Lanka, uh, in, to such an extent that some people would say that if not for China's assistance, we may not have been able to defeat the terrorists in 2009. Most recently, uh, when we were confronted by the COVID-19 epidemic, China provided us with 26 million doses of vaccine, 3 million of which came as a gift. And it, it is safe to say that uh, the Chinese vaccine has helped us to control the epidemic substantially in Sri Lanka. China also in the uh, post-conflict period helped us tremendously in uh, our development efforts. There are highways built to Chinese assistance, harbors, airports, uh, and many other projects. So um, I would say that the bilateral relationship is on a very strong basis at the moment. The leaders of the two countries have been in touch with each other regularly. And uh, of course, like in any relationship, uh, we have to work on them, uh, on it continuously. You should not take anything for granted, but it is safe to say that our bilateral relationship is, uh, is now on a very strong basis, and we can be confident that uh, it will grow stronger and firmer in the future. Yeah, the then uh, Commerce Minister, you know, R.D. Uh, Saneni Yak, uh, played um, a very important role uh, in this pact. You know, he uh, said, I have always held the view that the political ideologies should not stand in the ways of countries trading with each other if that trade is to their mutual uh, advantage. Uh, you know, it resonates somewhat with today's uh, world as some politicians obviously attempts to, uh, let's say, you know, play up ideologies. You know, uh, we only deal with uh, countries with a similar ideology with us, things like that. So that's significant even today, right? It is very important today because linking trade with uh, political ideology 
results in not in benefits in the long run. It results in negative result, uh, negative impacts on people because we're talking about human beings. We're talking about people, people who produce goods for the marketplace. And then, of course, they're prevented from benefiting from the marketplace due to ideology. I, I would have thought that over the last 60 or 70 years, the world has matured and come to a point where uh, political ideology could be separated from trade needs. Unfortunately, it has not happened. Even today, we have ideology being used to interfere with global trends in trade. Uh, we also have to recognize that it was globalization that brought prosperity across the world. Many countries have benefited tremendously from globalization and they will continue to benefit. But if you start using uh, politics as a lever uh, to either enhance trade or diminish trade, I think we are doing a disservice to humanity because facts speak for themselves. We know that the world uh, has benefited tremendously from the free flow of goods and services across borders. Unfortunately, this message does not seem to sit well with, uh, in certain quarters. And I'm, I hope that we will uh, go ahead from there. I mean, we need to leave this situation behind and improve so that all of humanity can benefit from trade. Uh, yeah, Mr. Ambassador, the minister R.G. Saniniak also uh, made a prediction, a very famous one. He said uh, at that time, you know, China will be a key factor in global trade. And uh, when we look back, you know, China is uh, today uh, the largest trading nation in terms of goods and the largest trading partner of uh, more than 120 economies around the world. So, I mean, when we look back, I mean, how completely right he is. He was, uh, Arjit Seneca was uh, an icon in Ceylon politics at the time. Even today, uh, he's remembered as someone who contributed tremendously to Sri Lanka politically. He also came from a very prominent uh, political family. What he said then is true today also. China today, in addition to what you said, is also the most uh, lucrative consumer market in the world. It also has the largest reserve of uh, foreign currency in the world. Uh, Sri Lanka uh, can benefit from this situation. I mean, our relationship with China uh, can be mutually beneficial. Sri Lanka's friendship uh, has enabled Sri Lanka to encourage China to assist it in different ways. And I hope that our economic relationship will grow further. And I believe uh, we can talk more about that. Uh, yes, uh, Ambassador, you know, we know that Sri Lanka has been uh, for weeks in a battle against an economic crisis, which many think uh, is the worst probably since the independence of the country in 1948. So what do you think are the factors involved in uh, leading to this crisis? A number of factors combined uh, this year and uh, created the crisis for us. Uh, the, the critical factor, the catalyst was the pandemic. The pandemic resulted in our tourism shrinking to very low numbers. Uh, tourism contributed before the pandemic 12 to 15% of our national income. Then our export markets shrank. Uh, Sri Lanka exported most of its industrial goods to the West, to Europe and to America. And those markets shrank dramatically, uh, resulting in our export earnings also diminishing. Simultaneously, uh, Sri Lanka's, uh, the, the amounts remitted to Sri Lanka by Sri Lankan workers overseas uh, shrank also. Uh, the remittances of 
Sri Lankan workers in foreign countries was one of the major sources of our national income. Uh, because of the pandemic, the, the, many of them lost uh, job, their jobs, others were laid off temporarily. And as a result, the remittances also came down dramatically. And of course, to add it to all this, we now have the Russian-Ukrainian uh, conflict, uh, which has pushed up prices, uh, also disrupted supply chains. Uh, our sources of uh, grain and fertilizer uh, have been disrupted. So all these things combined, and Sri Lanka has come to a very difficult position. Uh, our, with our foreign exchange reserves, diminishing dramatically, we have not been able to meet our loan repayments for the borrowings we had made over the years. So this has also added to our mysteries. So today, as a result of this, there are shortages of fuel, uh, liquid, natural gas, uh, diesel, uh, certain items of food and medicines, etc. Again, uh, another factor that has impacted on the lives of people is are the power cuts. The power cuts have been uh, catalyzed by the lack of foreign exchange to purchase the fuel. Of course, the government is making a very determined effort to deal with the situation. However, uh, I must say that the situation is not easy. So we have asked our friends to help us in this, to get over this current hump. We've asked our friends like China to, uh, to ex uh, extend the helping hand because we are literally on the edge of a precipice and we need our friends to pull us back mm -hmm. onto dry land. And uh, we've, we've asked our friends, we have also gone to the IMF as you know, uh, but the, assistance from the IMF will take time because there is a negotiating process that has to be gone through. And um, I hope that the, the measures that the government has taken to deal with the current situation, plus the assistance that could come from our friends will help us to get over this, uh, this problem. Mm -hmm. uh, we hope that it will happen soon. Uh, you know, Ambassador, some people assert that, you know, it is a Chinese a strategic trap and the BRI, Belt and Road Initiative, that has dragged Sri Lanka into the economic base. Uh, what do you make of that kind of allegation? Uh, I, it's very important to uh, differentiate between propaganda, convenient propaganda, and reality. So, Sri Lanka, uh, was the country that came to China for assistance, especially after the end of the conflict. We needed to grow fast. We needed to recover fast. We came to China. China did not come to Sri Lanka with a bag full of dollars and say, here's the money spent. We came to China. Then, of course, it is important to remember, and I emphasize this and underline this, uh, it is less than 10% of Sri Lanka's external debt is owed to China. Uh, most of it, nine, close to 9% is owed to multilateral institutions, international financial uh, organizations, and other bilateral donors. So it is uh, mischievous to suggest that Chinese funds uh, resulted in a debt trap and brought Sri Lanka to where it is now. Of course, we, have, we are finding it difficult to pay back loans, but most of these loans are not from China. And our difficulties stem from the factors that I described earlier, rather than uh, purely from the borrowings we made. And the borrowings were necessary, because uh, I need to say it again, that Sri Lanka, uh, had to uh, take a very concerted, make a concerted effort to develop fast after the con internal conflict ended. 
we needed to become more prosperous, more uh, of, a, of a, a country that attended to the needs of its people more than it had done before. And of course, uh, some people suggest that because we, uh, we borrowed for the purpose of building our highways, our harbors and our airports, we got into a difficult situation. I don't think that is correct at all. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Ambassador, we know like uh, Sri Lanka is uh, talking to the IMF and also regional countries uh, like uh, China and India. Uh, speak of the two countries, you know, some in the Western media have portrayed China and India as trying to win influences in the region. Uh, what's your take on the view and how does Sri Lanka you know, balance its relationship uh, with China and India? I think we should be careful about being trapped uh, into terminology used by interested third parties. Uh, we do not think there is a need for a balancing act between India and China. India has been a very long-standing friend of Sri Lanka. Our relationship goes back thousands of years. Our culture, our religion, our people have all been inspired by uh, India. And in more recent times, India has been a friend and a great supporter of Sri Lanka. Most recently, India has come to forward, help Sri Lanka to manage the current financial crisis in the country. At the same time, China has been a, a, a partner and a friend for thousands of years. As I mentioned earlier on, China has helped Sri Lanka tremendously in recent years. Even now, we know that certain requests made by our leaders to the Chinese leadership are being, are being considered uh, in a positive way. So my own view is that, and I believe that this will be shared by many, we treat uh, both countries as essential friends and, uh, and uh, helpers of Sri Lanka. Uh, we, uh, it is not a question of balancing one country against the other. It is a matter of ensuring that our close friendships with both are maintained in, uh, in the same way. And, and also uh, it is very important, it's important to remember that we do not, as Sri Lanka, we do not maintain relationships with countries at the expense of anybody else or in order to maintain uh, another relationship. Our relationships are based on intrinsic values, long-standing connections, and uh, a desire uh, to go forward in the world with more friends than, and, and, and other, than others. So let me say very clearly that for us, China is very, very important. India is very important. And so these relations will be maintained on their own merits rather than with a view to balance one against the other. Uh, well said, uh, yes, uh, relationship with both countries are important uh, instead of balancing, instead of against, uh, being against each other. Uh, in a telephone conversation last year, uh, with the Sri Lankan President uh, Rajapaksa, Chinese President Xi Jinping said uh, that China uh, was ready to provide robust impetus for Sri Lanka's uh, post-pandemic economic recovery and the sustainable development. So what specific actions have the two countries taken uh, to help Sri Lanka recover from the pandemic? Now, to, the, the important first point is that China provided us with 26 million doses of vaccine, three million as a gift. And there's no doubt that the Chinese provided Sinopharm vaccine helped tremendously to bring the epidemic under control in Sri Lanka. So the epidemic is so much under control in Sri Lanka now that our borders are open and anyone who has a vaccinate, vaccine certificate can enter the country. So our border, borders have been open. 
Then in addition to that, last year, the China Development Bank gave us uh, $500 million to assist with the post-pandemic recovery. Prior to that, the AIIB, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, also extended uh, assistance to the uh, tune of $180 million. Most recently, the AIIB has repurposed an already approved loan of $100 million for the purchase of essential items, especially medicine. Uh, China recently gave us uh, $500 million yuan worth of assistance. Uh, and already I know that uh, certain med uh, medicines have been sent to Sri Lanka by airlifted to Sri Lanka. Uh, a consignment of rice is expected to reach Sri Lanka in the middle of this month. We have also, we are also now in the process of talking about obtaining uh, diesel and fertilizer from China. So the, these are the things, the tangible uh, modes of assistance that have been made available by China to Sri Lanka. We hope that there will be other things that we can obtain from China in the near future to get over the current crisis. Because once we are over this hump, I don't think we will need assistance as such. We will need to develop the country. Uh, Ambassador, you encourage the Chinese tour group to direct uh, a million uh, tourists to Sri Lanka last year. Uh, you know, despite this current, uh, obviously, the domestic and international difficulties, uh, so what in-depth cooperation do you expect the two countries, China and Sri Lanka, to carry out in the fields of tourism and trade? In fact, if not for the pandemic, intervening, uh, drinking glasses of champagne at the large number of Chinese visitors to Sri Lanka. As we know, China uh, sent out 169 billion travelers in 2019. Of course, that number has come down dramatically as a result of the pandemic. And Sri Lanka needed only a small fraction of that uh, to make a huge change to our economy. The Chinese are also uh, generous spenders when they travel. And this embassy had expected to take, uh, encourage a million Chinese to visit Sri Lanka. And we were on the verge of achieving that goal when all these lockdowns and restrictions came into effect. It's a country that I can, uh, without any embarrassment, promote readily because uh, we will uh, welcome visitors to Sri Lanka sooner than later. Already there are large numbers coming, beginning to come from Northern Europe, uh, visitors who are escaping from their harsh winters. And I hope that sooner than later, China will open its borders and there will be thousands of Chinese visiting Sri Lanka. We've also talked to the Chinese authorities about making Sri Lanka a preferred destination for Chinese visitors. And I hope this will happen. Uh, tourism will uh, very quickly help us to turn the corner and pull ourselves out of the current uh, difficult situation that is confronting us. Uh, I hope that this will happen sooner than later. Mm -hmm. Well, let's shift it to a big upcoming event here in China. Uh, the Communist Party of China will hold the 20th National Congress in the second half of the year. Uh, as a Sri Lanka ambassador to China, you know, what will you pay a special attention to during this twice a decade party congress? And of course, naturally, uh, I hope to be present as uh, a diplomatic boy at this event. We also look forward to the new uh, policies that will be adopted for implementation in the future. We know that one reason, at least in my view and in the view of many others, that China has achieved uh, this remarkable growth and level of prosperity is because of the leadership provided by the Communist Party of China. Uh, the, the very steadfast leadership, the vice guidance provided, and also the people-centered approach of the Communist Party has helped uh, this country to achieve what it has achieved, the, the, the fantastic communication systems, the railway 
lines, the highways, the prosperity level, the fabulous cities, the, the conservation of nature. I mean, there's very, uh, there are very few other places in the world where you can step out of your apartment into a jungle of roses or other flowering shrubs. Living in Beijing, I'm constantly amazed at the, the, the cleanliness of this city and the beauty of this city. The gardens are so well maintained. And then you see people everywhere, people enjoying uh, the bounty that has been provided to them. And of course, uh, all this didn't happen uh, automatically. All this is the result of the leadership provided by the Communist Party of China and the very sage guidance provided by its leaders. And of course, uh, we wish the Chinese people more success, more prosperity, and a greater future. Ambassador, you know, China, after decades of exploration and practices, uh, has formed a, a political system with the Chinese characteristics, let's say. Uh, what do you think of China's current political system, you know, including the success it has achieved and the controversies it faces? Of course, any system will have its critics, uh, whether it's good or bad, or successful or not, will have its critics. Naturally, the Chinese system will have its critics, but the results produced by the system the, the socialist system with Chinese characteristics are just phenomenal. They are to be seen on the ground. They are to be seen in the people of this country. Uh, 700 million people or more have been pulled out of poverty and China has eliminated uh, extreme poverty. Uh, it, this has never been achieved anywhere else in the world. There are other goals China is striving to achieve like uh, carbon uh, peaking by 2030 and carbon neutrality by 2060. Again, this will be a huge change to the world that we live in. If we do not address the question of uh, environment conservation and the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, we may not have a world to live in in the next 50, 60 years. So China will make a big contribution this area. And of course, uh, you look around and you see the prosperity level of the people, the, 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 the crowds in the restaurants, the, in the entertainment areas. They are a reflection of what this country has achieved. So as I said before, there will be critics. And of course, if there are no critics, then there's something wrong. Uh, but the important thing is China has uh, progressed adapted, and in my view, is continuing to move forward. Uh, the, I've been asked whether China is a model for anybody else. I think there are good things about the Chinese model that can be emulated. But Sri Lanka, for example, will have to find its own path to prosperity because we have our own unique characteristics which we have to work with and work on. So there are good things that we can copy from China, emulate from China. And we should also work with China. Uh, I think there are lots of things that we can work with China in the future. Well, with that, we come to the end of today's discussion. Many thanks to Ambassador Kahonda. Uh, you can also find us on the CGTN app or on YouTube. I'm Xu Qinzhuo. Thanks for being with us. See you next time.